it, it's time for our Small Business Drives Colorado Spotlight of the Week. And this week, rather than spotlighting a company, a small business, we are spotlighting an inventor, a single individual who has a decades-long ce celebrated career here in Colorado of inventing and selling successfully different products. He is Frank Armbruster, who is well-known in the Denver community. He is a regular attendee and participant at the Investors Roundtables meetings. I saw him recently at the Rockies Venture Club. Frank, do you go to any other events on a regular basis? Some? I just spent a good portion of the day at the uh, Harlem Garden Show downtown. I'm a volunteer at the Wings Museum and we had an exhibit there. A I bunch saw, of airplanes. I saw you there too at the Wings. Did you see the right? I, did, I did. And, and if you see Frank, you usually will remember it because Frank is distinctive. He has, he could patent what I would call his Santa Claus beard. You have a natural, you're gifted with a natural bushy white beard. You have bushy white eyebrows. And you could play the part of Santa, although you don't necessarily dress up as Santa on a regular basis. I have been doing Santa for about 15 years now. Last year was the first year that I missed the Christmas season. You are in studio with us today. People have, this is Radio of the Imagination, but David, do you, know, do you want to describe what it is that Frank is wearing? Yes. Frank is wearing a wonderfully wigged hat with flowers in tie-dye colors. This matches his wonderful suit, which has been tie-dyed. It has great uh, pinstriping of black, but he is he an the American most flag? outstanding fluorescent flagrant person <laughs> you will ever find you, you can. on the planet at this moment. <laughs> I'll tell you what's missing. By the way, I, the picture I saw of Frank, Frank is, I don't, head to toe, his shoes, his shoes are patentable, tie-dye patentable, rainbow-colored shoes. But the funny thing is that, David, in some ways, Frank's presentation, he is a character. You actually said, Frank, that you came to studio today in character. What, what is the name of this character that you are representing today? This is Rainbow Man, the colorful mathematician. Okay. Rainbow Man, the colorful mathematician. Well, here's what I want to say. I'm afraid that sometimes people who get to meet Frank, and he is friendly, he is jovial, and he is eccentric, overlook the fact that he's a genius. He is a genuine inventor and business genius. He is an educator. He is deeply committed to math education, history education, other education. And you must go to Wings Over the Rockies and sit down with him and talk to him because I spent time with him when we had Carl Rove right, here. And, yes, and, and I couldn't leave. Frank is just, uh, uh, he's amazing. <laughs> but I, the other thing I want to say, so I want to give, Frank, I want to tell people so they know who they're really listening to here. I want to give them a sense that you, are, again, are not just an eccentric. Yes, you are an eccentric, but you're not just an eccentric. That you are a genius. You invented in what year Instant Insanity? You, I it's a game. Instant Insanity in 1965. 1965. Yeah. And in 1965, 1966, it became the best-selling game in America? 68-69 uh, was the time when the sales took off. Became the best-selling game in the United States. Well, actually made the... Guinness Book of Records for that year is the best all-time selling dollar dollar puzzle toy. Right. And and it sold like 12 and a half million units, yeah. is that correct? That's correct. Now, uh, you've invented innumerable items before and since. One of the you brought some of these in the studio. If people will go to our YouTube channel, you know, our YouTube channel look for Business Unconventional on YouTube or Small Business Drives Colorado, we are going to film Frank today showing us and demonstrating some of what he brought to the studio. Since you can't see it on the radio, we're not going to show it to you right now on the radio, but, but Frank, you, you're one, among your more recent inventions is a clock for people who have macular degeneration. Tell us what, how that clock works. I have macular degeneration, and when the optometrist told me that, I immediately started studying it. When you've got this thing, you want to know all you can about it. And I found that uh, there is a grid called the Amsler grid, A-M-S-L-E-R. And if you look at this grid and the lines are wavy, you've got it. 
and I talked to several optometrists and uh, ocular specialists and retinal specialists and they said, yeah, we give all of our patients a paper copy of this grid, but they don't use it. Somehow or other it's inconvenient, nobody uses it, and according to the National Institutes of Health uh, eye study, you should be looking at this thing every day because this thing comes on suddenly. And so I conceived the idea of making a clock with the Amsler grid on the clock that sticks magnetically on your refrigerator door. So every time you open the refrigerator, you, if you don't want to know what time it is, you've got to look at this thing. And it will tell you right away. Now, now Frank, do you hold Is that patents? logic or what? That is great logic. Do you hold great. patents? Do you have it's them? patent pending right now. It's in the process. So the clock is patent pending. Yeah. For some of your other inventions, you have patents that already exist? Uh, yes, I've had several, but I'm not basically a patent person. Okay. So I'm a marketing person when it comes to my inventions. I'd rather go to market and have a first market share than have a patent. If I were just riding in an elevator with you, and the, based on the way you're dressed now, I'm not sure I would get in an elevator with you. But if I, but but using our, I would. <laughs> I, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. What do you say to somebody when I say, Frank, nice to meet you. I'm Dean Redbird. I co-host a radio show on 710 KNUS. What do you do? Oh, oh, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm an inventor and I'm specializing in young people starting with the emerging reader, the preschool reader, and I go all the way to the college level with the things that I do. I basically right now am deep in the process of designing crossword puzzles with controlled vocabulary. Okay, were you trained as an educator? Sort of. I kind of backed into the education business. I was, I was in, the, in the aviation business, in the aerospace business, and I was teaching night as a substitute for a friend of mine who had to go down to the Cape because we had a missile problem. And he called and he said, Frank, you've got to take my class tonight. Well, he didn't come back for about seven months. He was, this was the snark missile. And they called the waters off the Cape the snark infested waters. Maybe you've heard Cute. that. Cute. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I had built the class up then enough so there were enough for two of us. And my administrator says, Arm Brewster, if you're going to keep teaching, you better go get a credential. So I went up nights and weekends to UCLA School of Education. I got myself a teaching credential. And after that, the boss said, hey, you got a credential. Some guy in the, in the East has invented a thing called a transistor. And we're going to have to learn about it because we're all vacuum tube in the, in the flight test business. So get yourself some travel money and go learn about transistors and learn how to convert transistor analog circuitry into, or help, to vacuum tube analog into transistor Va analog. Vacuum tube Va amplifiers are sought after for musicians world over. Absolutely. And I did that and I wrote a little booklet because the engineers... At what year are you talking about? We're talking about 1955-56. Okay. okay. The engineers... So you're coming up on 60 years of having basically tune, starting to fine-tune yourself as a inventor and writer. Is that right? Yes. Well, actually, my first invention was when I was a freshman in high school. It was earlier than that. What did you invent? I invented a thing that would today be called a drafting machine. Okay. It was a... Yeah, you, you put the T-square up against here and it snapped magnetically against the edge of the board. So wherever you moved it, it was always How square many, to the if board. We, that's, if that's, we had the time... My dad used that. He was a civil engineer. Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. Yeah. Frank, if we had the time to rattle off everything you have invented or written, would we be talking about more or less than a hundred items? Right now, I can't remember all the names, but I've written them down. I remember the numbers. It's 96. 96. Yeah. Wow. If you don't count the one that I joke about that I talked about with you last well, night. Tell, tell our <laughs> listeners what that is. He's currently working on a toothbrush and... It's a, a battery-operated toothbrush and a fly rod handle. Combined. That's just what the world... Is it made out of cork? <laughs> yes. He's easy. Or bamboo. So, I did that because I want to teach these inventors how to go through the patenting process. And I'm not going to patent this thing. That's a stupid, a stupid combination of stuff. But using that as the device, I hope to be able to, to get these inventors to understand. Well, you can take you, crazy thanks things. Thanks to Rita Crompton and the Inventors Roundtable and the Mother of Invention, uh, Mother of Invention Regional Conference. I have to tell you, what, so Frank has this tie-dye head-to-toe outfit with a flamboyant hat. He, it could be a pimp hat. It's not, but it's a flamboyant hat. It was, when I came to the first meeting at the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce where they 
me, it was a bitter cold day. It must have been under 20 degrees. And Frank is out there in this outfit directing traffic, directing people coming to the Mother of Inventions Regional Conference to where the parking is. You've got you got good health, I guess, Frank. I mean, you're, you're, you've got stamina, that much I can say. I've, I've been blessed. I've had uh, prostate cancer, heart attack, uh, macular degeneration, and I'm deaf, but I'm hard to kill. You are, uh, you are <laughs> great. Let me say something. He's a great role model. It is why we have selected him to be our spotlight honoree for small He's business. He's else. Is he not? I forgot to mention the arthritis. <laughs> How old are you today? I am just about uh, three weeks short of my 84th birthday. Well, congratulations. That is wonderful, and you have a lot that you can be teaching people. Frank is going to continue with us both on our YouTube channel and on our MondayMorningRadio.com edition. Frank, we're going to let you uh, listen in now because David and I want to remind some people of some upcoming to another edition of Monday Morning Radio. We have a very special guest in addition for you this week. You're going to have a lot of fun and learn some great things. I'm Dean Ripport. I'm here with my co-host, who is David Biondo. Yes, David Biondo, and I am here. Uh, David is I'm fiddling with the fiddle disc. He's preoccupied because we have an inventor on this week's Monday Morning Radio. He is a incredibly smart, innovative inventor who has had some very successful stuff. He is an educator. His, he's based out of Denver, Colorado. His name is Frank Armbruster, and he was our guest on the broadcast portion of Business Unconventional, Be Unconventional. It airs every Sunday at 8 o'clock on 710 Can US in Denver, but we've asked Frank to stay on. And for those of you who are most intrigued, you can also watch this interview on our YouTube channel at it's for under business unconventional. But Frank, first of all, welcome to Monday Morning Radio. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Glad to be here. Where are you from originally? I was born in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas. Well, the um, Monday Morning Radio is associated with a organization out of Austin, Texas, called Wizard Academy. I think you would like Wizard oh, Academy. Oh, I know Austin quite well. But I, I think we have the here. Wizard sitting here, don't you? It's in the. Um, it's in, what are they called? Us. The not something hills. What do they call the hills of Texas? The Texas Hill Country. Yes, that's it. Uh, just outside of Austin. I want to tell folks who are listening. You may have by now. You may have already heard the broadcast segment. But uh, Frank he is a educator. He is a innovator. He is a inventor. He is um, most successful in terms of units sold. Uh, invention was a game he invented in the early 1960s called Instant Insanity. That in 68 and 69 became one of the most popular games in the world at that point. Let me add a disclaimer, if you don't mind, in okay. the interest of integrity. Yes, integrity. That puzzle that you have in your hand there, which we call Instant Insanity, was actually devised as part of a combinatorial set back in the 1800s, and all I did was modernize it, and I made it out of plastic, because in the early days, you could solve it by looking at the grain of the wood or the pattern that was printed on it. Let me read what it says on here. It's called Instant Insanity. Right now what I'm holding in my hands, for those of you who can see it on YouTube, I'm holding it out, I have a picture of it, um, is the, what you say, is the sole remaining, still wrapped version from 1998. They're coming out with new ones. But here's what it says. Notice that there are four different colors showing on each side of this stack of blocks. Open the package, mix them up, and then restack them so that there are again four colors, all different showing on each side. Be calm, but examine them with care to satisfy you, yourself that this is how they are packed. You may never ever see them this way again. It's kind of use, as you said, it's sort of the early edition of Rubik's Cube. And Rubik's Cube, of course, became a global success. It still is. Why didn't you invent Rubik's Cube? You invented Instant Insanity. Rubik's Cube has a mechanical problem that I couldn't solve. Which is? Which is how you assemble that thing so that it will rotate in the three axes I see. without coming apart. You didn't have to deal with it. Now, you're saying that, that this really had its roots many, many years ago. 
What was the background? You sold 12.5 million units of this. You not personally, but the 12.5 million units of this were sold. Um, why did you invent this in the first place? Where, how did you come up with this idea? I'm interested in getting kids of all ages interested in science and mathematics. And there's a branch of mathematics called combinatorics. How many ways can you stack three books on a shelf if you don't count up, down, back, and forth? And the answer to that is a problem in combinatorics. And the, the puzzle that you have right. is probably the ultimate challenge in combinatorics because you have to not deal not only with the position in a line, but the color on the face. Is there one solution to instant insanity out as the numerator of a denominator of how many possibilities? It's over 40,000. 40,000 possibilities and one solution? One solution if you count the yellow over here or yellow over there. That is, a, that is one solution. There are the little permutations of how many ways can you stack the four once you get the orientation solved. So you like games, you like puzzles, you like history. What are some of your other passions? World War II, military airplanes, model airplanes, kites. I like this. So here's, I'm going to read you. You gave me your mission statement. We didn't read this on the broadcast. You said, my mission is to research, select, design, develop, produce, test, and offer for sale games, puzzles, magic tricks, toys, and play activities and materials supporting academic outcomes while at the same time making learning and achieving more fun, more effective, and more interesting for the learner, the administrator, teacher, tutor, or parent. Lovely, lovely mission statement. And you actually have, you work with schools, you've come up with all sorts of stuff. I'm holding, David has been playing with something called Fiddle, fiddle discs. discs. What is Fiddle Discs? It's a it's hey, go ahead. Can I read it? Sure. Imaginative, creative, building toy for girls and boys. Fiddle with these discs and discover the fun. Okay, you make these things right here in Aurora, Colorado? Yes, they're made about 40 miles north of here at a molder, a local molder. So I li one of the things I like about you, Frank, is that um, a lot of people have ideas, a lot of people are even tinkerers, but they don't turn them from garage material into actual products. You do. How many, roughly how many products for sale have you generated during your, the course of your career to date? Well, it's, it, the number is 96, but some of them aren't quite, well, some of them have, have already died, obviously. Right. And some are still in my head and are yet to get out. So show, now we're on camera, show us the eye clock. Uh -huh. tell, tell us again a <laughs> oh, little bit. Oh, okay. It, it's right the here, yeah. On? Uh -huh. yeah. It's, it's on. Well, about three and a half to four years ago, I was diagnosed with macular degeneration. Now, macular degeneration is a, is a bad thing. It's not a good thing. We agree with that. It almost never happens under age 50, but it is the leading cause of blindness over age 75. And I won't give you the white paper I wrote about it, but basically the diagnostic device is a grid. It looks like graph paper. And if you look at that thing, one eye and then the other eye, if the lines are straight and regular, if they're fuzzy, it's okay. But if they're not straight and regular, if the lines come down like this, you've got macular degeneration, and there is a vitamin combination that will affect it, stop its growth, and in so you my got case... So you got diagnosed with this. You, you hadn't really known much about it. No. Okay. You come home, and immediately do you say to yourself, Frank Armbruster, I'm going to have an invention I'm going to create out of this, or do you just start studying it and then you set, and then an idea comes to mind? How does it go from you get a diagnosis and you turn it into a product? What happened? What was the process? What was the thinking process? When did you know you were going to do a product? The process is something like, okay, I got a problem. I'm an engineer. Let's do some problem solving on this. What is known about it first? And I spent many hours on the internet researching A-R-E-D-S, which is the National Institutes of Health name for the age-related eye disease study. It's a reliable study, well done, good, scientifically done. And there is a compound on the market under the name of patients, the name. Don't worry about it. 
I dash caps, which is sold at Walgreens, okay. and Preserve Vision, all one word, mm -hmm. which is sold at the supermarkets uh, by Bosch and Loam. And I looked at the vitamin content of those, and the vitamin content is the same. It's mega doses of certain vitamins, which I haven't memorized. But I started taking it, and every day I was looking at this Amsler grid. Trying to see if you saw any improvement or any, or any deterioration. What were you looking for? Well, first it stopped. The, the, the deterioration. The deterioration stopped. Okay. And then I got to thinking, well, okay, I talked to several specialists, the, the optometrists and the retinal specialists, and they said, yeah, we give these paper copies to people all the time. Every patient that comes here gets a copy of the paper, but they don't use it. For some reason or other, it's inconvenient. Hmm. Well, some years ago, I started making clocks that hang from the ceiling for the classroom. Okay. They're called Logan clocks, and they hang from a, a telescoping magnetic device from the grid on the ceiling. And I thought, well, suppose we had a magnetically attachable clock on the refrigerator door. I said, yeah, I can do that. So you notice this is made out of wood, if you look at the back of it, and it's got a standard clock battery mechanism in it. And so I went out to my garage, which is the woodworking part of my shop, and I cut this thing out, and I put the magnetic material on it, and it's on my, this is the one from my now, refrigerator Is this for door. sale any place right now? You've invented it, but is it being marketed anywhere? No, it's patent pending, and it has been submitted to some of the optical companies. It's called iClock for now. Yeah, I'm hoping that one of the one of the major companies will license it from me and then offer it for sale to their customers or they will actually give it to their customers after they prescribe. If you're over 50 and it looks like you're a candidate, they will give it to you to put on your refrigerator. Frank, I suspect the David, did you want to say something? Oh, Sorry. I think it's just genius, you know, just the whole concept of putting it on the refrigerator and looking at it and seeing whether or not you have any deterioration. What intrigues me about Frank is, and I don't know that I've met somebody quite like you before, I mean, you are, you, again, you are a genius in terms of what you do, um, but it's, what intrigues me so much is that he has no fear of being an inventor. Um, he doesn't worry about, he, you, somehow you figure out how it's going to get manufactured, how it's going to get the legal protection it needs, ultimately you give it a name, how it's going to get packaged, all of those things that I think are barriers for a lot of people who might have a good idea, but they're but they are put off by the process of going from having an idea to turning it into a product and hopefully a successful and the distribution product. through you know Absolutely. how much of this doctors. did you you're involved with inventors roundtable is this stuff you learned um, later in life is this something that just came natural to you the idea of being able to turn an invention into a real product. Most of it happened as a result of making some very expensive, disastrous mistakes. Love it. And then saying, I ain't going to do that again. <laughs> Albert that Einstein, Einstein right here. Can you recall one particular mistake that might be educational for people who are listening? Something you did that really hit you enough on the side of the head that you didn't do it again and you could maybe spare other people from making the same stupid mistake? I hadn't thought about that, but if you give me a moment sometime. No problem. We'll do that. So in the got, process, I will think about uh, some of my more disasters. How often are you in schools? You, you're very educationally oriented, and I've seen on your website and other materials that you have. By the way, it's armbrewsterpuzzles.com. It's arm Brewster testimonials from teachers and other educators talking about how your puzzles and games are so helpful in the classroom. Are, are you in a classroom? fairly regularly? I'm at least once a week at the Logan School, which You're is a Denver. charter school. In Denver, Aurora, where is it's it? It's on the old Lowry campus. Lowry campus, okay. And I'm That's at least Denver. twice a month at the North Arvada Middle School. And you're an expert in neuro -psy Physiology. Physiology, neuroanatomy, neuroplasticity. Neuro I'll translate. Neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, neuroplasticity. Astrophysics. And big words. He's an expert on big words, neuro big words. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Words we can. Brain stuff. But uh, right. where did you go to school? Where did you where did you go to college? You don't remember. I do not have a bachelor's degree. That's great. Okay. But look, you are look. I love that. I love 
it more than you can imagine because you are a uh, relentless, energetic, enthusiastic entrepreneur who basically says all those little obstacles that other people let stop them, they don't stop me. I don't care about them. I don't. So you come across, here's a guy who is, and I don't doubt it, an expert in neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, and neuroplasticity. What was the, what was the math science of, of knowing the various ways you could arrange this? What was that called? It's called combinatorics. Combinatorics. And he is not a MIT engineering graduate with a PhD. No, but he he's got is, more vision than most. He's self-taught. He's self-educated. I'm a, I'm a Bravo. voracious reader. Bravo. And mm -hmm. I'm stubborn about digging for information. Right. I am absolutely delighted that we've got internet, that I can cruise that internet. And I have recently, let's say the last two years, been buying disc courses from a company called The Teaching Company. Yes, know it very well. They have lots of sales, so you can I have spent more money than I should have you on those. buy the videos from them? you buy the videos and watch them? I course? buy the videos and watch them, and I back them up, and I take photographs of the screen, and I convert those into puzzles. I'm not gonna, I, I have a question that I, the journalist in me has to ask you, but I'm going to ask it to you in the most polite way that I know. Okay? It, it has to deal with your wealth, but I'll tell you how I'm going to ask it to you. What's the? I don't want to know how. I don't want to know whether you're wealthy or you're not wealthy today, because that's intru that's intrusive. But I do want to know this: What is the most money you ever made on an invention? Was it instant insanity? The first check I got from Parker Brothers was sixty thousand dollars. Awesome. That awesome. was about two months. It was the first quarter after it began. It's it's. How do you measure your success? Be do you measure your success, Frank, by how much you earn? by what impact you have, by how much fun you have creating it. How, how do you define success for you? For me, it's fun. I tell people I am rich beyond measure, but I couldn't write you a check more than about $100 right now. Okay. You know, he may be turning 84, but he's like a 10-year-old. What's your birthday specifically? April 17th, yeah. 1929. Well, happy birthday on April 17th. We're going to have to make it Frank Armbruster Day on an annual basis for <laughs> Business Unconventional and Small Business Drive America because really you are a walking billboard for telling people, don't tell me what I can't do. You know, and that is, you are, you're just a walking billboard for saying, I can do it. You know, tell me what it is, I'll do it. Put an obstacle in my way. Tell me I've got macular degeneration. I'll I'll will make lemonade out of that lemon. I'll I'll take something. I'll find some way to do great things with it. You brought along a suitcase. Show us some of your other toys. I I call them toys metaphorically. You can show us the birdhouse. Whatever you got there. Okay. This is Mancala. Now that's Mancala. Mancala is typically a wooden board, and it's the African national game. It's the answer to a couple of interesting questions. One is, what is the oldest known board game that's still played in anything resembling its original form? Of course, the game of life. Fine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. Go ahead. And it is probably, well, it's the forerunner of the abacus. Right. And I teach, I, I teach the children to play the game, and then you I teach this. them how that's to do point. abacus. Okay. Uh, and in my, the book that I wrote on the back teaches the relationship between the position of the stones and the abacus itself with the beads on the wire. Now, in what year did you pull this version of Mancala together? How old a product is this for you? Is this a new oh, product? That, no, no, that's about 10 years old, but okay. it took me a while to be able to afford the tooling. It's also made up here in Colorado. It took me a while to, to get the tooling made the way I wanted what it. What do you Notice do? You design a prototype in your home shop, and then you take it to an outside vendor and ask them to tool it for you? Yes, yes, okay. typically. Um, and what is the advantage of this particular um, version of Mancala, the way you designed it? When you teach Mancala to children, it's difficult for them to understand which is their farm and which is your farm, your, far, your side of the board and my side of the board. So that's why it's two different colors. Okay. And then it has, I've made an agricultural model. Most games, most competitive games, have a, a combat model or a dominance model. This is an agricultural model, and so the names of the moves are you sow the seeds. This end is called your silo. This group is called your farm. And picking up your winnings is called harvesting. Interesting, interesting. What is, 
So is this um, is this now sold through regular stores? Is this sold through your website? Is this for sale at all? It's sold in a few stores. Yes, the st uh, the store called uh, Beyond the Blackboard, I believe, still has stock, and McGuckin's Hardware in Boulder has it in stock. The Bank School Supply, there's a group of three or four of them. They have it. This is a great game for really... There's one called Jake's Toy Shop. That's a delightful toy shop. It's an unconventional. It's not your... Well, one well, of our previous our guests yes. has the largest... Well, is it the largest toy store in Michigan? It's certainly yes. the most successful toy store in Michigan. We know some people in the toy industry that we ought to introduce this to. Now, do you have an inventory of these? Do toy stores want to order them? I have... Uh, there are probably about 500 or more in my warehouse space right now, sounds just like that, that are all, all packaged, ready to ship. Sounds like Show us some more toys. Show us some more of what you've got. One of the things I like about this toy is it teaches you how to have change. Like, what do you mean by change? Well, you go to most cash registers today and they tell you, you give them so much money and then they tell you what your change should be. But when, you know, manual cash registers were in play, I used to always figure out what was left over. So, so what are we seeing here? Then back. Unique. What was the question? What is this? Oh, that is a a chessboard for use in the classroom. Look at that. It's magnetic. The pieces are mag the pieces are magnetic. You just break them apart. And the board, notice it's punched, it will go in a three ring binder. Absolutely. I have watched the experts quote teach chess in class. And if a teacher wants to hold a chess tournament in class, Chess does not have a time limit, but classes operate on time intervals. So and so if the game gets interrupted, like they have to take this board and find some place to put it or the game is spoiled. So I built that so that if the game gets interrupted, you put it in the three ring binder and it doesn't take space on the shelf. And that one three ring binder can hold 10 of those, which is enough for a, a 20 person tournament in the class. Wow. So, so David, I have an observation about Frank. And here's my observation. That he has an incredible gift, a talent for invention, for observation, for finding innovative solutions to practical issues like moving chess pieces in the classroom that everybody doesn't see. Maybe among our listeners, he's already networked. He's a, he's, he's a great networker. I mean, I, again, I see him where I go. He's a great networker. But maybe among our listeners, there are some people um, who can help him uh, with the distribution of his products. Now, Frank, you go, you, you're go. you going this year again to the hardware show in Las Vegas? Yes, I'll be at the National Hardware what Show. What do you do there? Well, I actually am, I, I, I draw a crowd. I'm sure you do. You, know, you go to a hardware do show, you, you go, go to a trade show. Do you show. go as Mr. Rainbow? I go as Rainbow Man. That's as Rainbow right. Man, okay. And I have a, some simple tricks that I do that draw the crowd, and then I transition from my presentation into the products that the other inventors have. So you represent other people's products? I represent Like some them. of Rita's clients, some of her products, you represent them? I, re I either rep yes I do, as a matter of fact. Okay. I, I'm a manufacturer's rep for several other instructional education. You're so, you're so good with um, kids. Do you have kids of your own? I have had two, yes. I lost one about ten years ago. I'm sorry. Uh, grandkids from the other one or not? I have four grandchildren. Okay. Are any of them in Colorado? Uh, no, they're all in Utah, Okay. and they're all grown college age now. Even your grandkids? Even my grandkids, yeah. Great-grandkids? I have one great-grandchild that is not quite a year old. Well, I have to imagine that in this, you know, as good as you are with somebody else's um, children and young people, that you know, being your great-granddaughter or great-grandson, um, you'd be a, a, a delightful great-grandfather. So what is this invention here? That's an invention. I'm, I'm interested in, in the emerging mathematician, the emerging reader. Right. And this is the beginning of something which I would like to call mathematical literacy. If you look at those, they are individual domino-shaped plastic pieces. Mm -hmm. And you notice the one marked two has two little steel balls in it. And it has a divider in the middle so that a child can shake it and say, oh, two is one and one, or it's two and zero, and it's zero and two. All of those will make up a two. Grab the six over here, for example. You open this guy up and take one out and, and, and play with it a bit. Because they are domino shape. They stack like dominoes. 10, 11. 
And every one of these things you have um, intellectual property rights to. Because these are yes. a lot of these things are ingenious. Either copyrights or trademarks. Okay. And uh, that particular one, I had. Uh, that's one of my disasters, in fact. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't really answer that question. Did we, we should that's come right. back to it's it. Just coming Tell up. Tell me now. why this is one of your disasters. Because it is. It has small parts. Okay. It's put together with ultrasonic welding. Okay. And if you drop one, the pieces will come out. And as a consequence, it was made in Oklahoma. A friend did the molding over there. And he died recently, gave it up. And now I have a broken mold that I spent a lot of money on. And I have a product that the ultrasonic welder was not adequate. So there's a, a small design change need to make, be made on the tooling. And I've got a lot of money in that. I've got a lot of faith in it. I recognize something, David, in Frank that I see in myself. And I would say that on some level it is a Achilles heel. And on another level it is what makes Frank terrific and I hope some of the better part of me. And that is that in many ways so, Frank, I am not an inventor in the way that you are. I'm more of an inventor of, of journalism products, newsletters, radio shows, videos, things like that. But I think I do it, I mean, I'd like to make more money doing it, but I think I do it for love. I often put in more money into creating it than is justifiable on a, what's going to be my financial return basis. I do it because I want it to exist. Um, and I think I see that with you. I think I see somebody, it seems to me, like you don't sit down and say, well, I could, I could create the mold for this, but it won't sell enough units, so I'm not going to do it. It seems like you're an eternal optimist and that you always believe that these products will be a success. Do you not? Yes. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if they bring a, a learner from position one to position two in some, some hierarchy, from an emerging mathematician to a graduate right. Ph.D., I consider myself a success if I can at least break even in the money, or if one of my products makes enough to support the another product. The other product. Well, the my big mistake with that was coming to the market too early, and okay. discovering that it, it had a mechanical flaw. Was well, it too late now? No, it's, 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 no, it's not too late. I, mean, I still have the pieces of the, I still have the pieces of the mold. Yeah, they're gonna learn. But let's tell people how they could get in contact with you. Again, you, they can go to your website at armbrewsterpuzzles.com, um, but I guess it's okay to give out your voice phone number? Certainly. Go right okay. ahead. He's in area code 303-745-1353, and let me tell you, if you're listening, if you stayed with us this long, chances are you're at least intrigued. I think you should be. I think Frank is a uh, walking... One of a kind. One of a kind with lots and lots of potential here. So if you know something about manufacturing and production and distribution, particularly in the educational games, toys, and puzzles market, um, we ought to hook you up with, with Frank. We're going to hook you up with a couple of people that we know through the radio show um, that will um, possibly uh, put some of this on the show. That, that may be able to buy some of these retail units from you. Um, I think we need to, we, we're going to have some guests coming up soon. Uh, who are educators, uh, I think we need to put some of this in front of them. I just think you need a little bit of a megaphone, Frank, for all these wonderful things that you've done because as terrific as they are, they'd be even more terrific if more children could learn and benefit from them. Well, thank you so much. So That's that would be kind terrific. statement. We're really running out of time. I don't want to I don't want to close this Monday morning radio unless if you saw something really great in the suitcase that you want people to see. So anything else left in the suitcase before we sign off? Bag of tricks. Anything left that if they don't see, you'd be disappointed. You can come back. Okay, we got. I think we covered a lot of it, folks. This is um, Frank Armbruster. He. We, we're going to celebrate April seventeenth, Frank Armbruster Day for Monday yes. morning radio. Small business drives Colorado. Small business drives America. You business can, unconventional. Yeah, and you can visit Frank at Wings Over the Rock. He hangs out at Wings Over the Rockies. Oh, Is as a matter of fact, I, let me say about Wings Over the Rockies. Sure. Come to the B-57. That's my airplane. Yes. Oh, yeah. For those of you who are <laughs> out, outside the country, it is a museum. It's an um, aircraft, particularly military aircraft museum. 
Um, and Frank is a volunteer there, I take it. Um, and um, good to have a chance to come see you. So Frank, thank you for being with us both on the broadcast portion, Business Unconventional, and for this extended entertaining edition of Monday Morning Radio. We wish you many years of invention and good health and be just who you are. You're terrific. Thank you so very much. And we can never spend enough time. It was a pleasure for me. We will be back, folks, next week with another edition of Monday Morning Radio. Until then, this is Dean Redford. And David Have a great week.